Hey guys, this is Sergey, and you're watching Dissecting the Code. Last time we discussed that one of the key benefits of managed environment like .NET is that you don't need to worry about, well, manually managing memory. However, even though the CLR does its best to collect objects that are no longer used by the application, memory leaks are still possible. And this is what we are going to cover today. So, how memory leaks are possible in .NET? There are a few common cases, but they all boil down to a simple fact. If a managed object isn't collected by the GC, there is a strong reference that prevents it from being collected. That's it. As simple as that. The instance might be added to a static collection or referenced directly or indirectly by a global or a long-lived object. The hardest part is figuring out why that happens and how to prevent this in practice. One of the most common causes of memory leaks in .NET is when a short-lived object subscribes to a global event or to an event of a longer-lived object. Let's look at the example. Let's say that we have a request processor that is used in gRPC infrastructure. The constructor of this class subscribes to domain and handle exception to trace or to track the, the crashes of the application. And the gRPC infrastructure by default creates a new instance for handling each individual requests. So let's, let's mimic this behavior. Let's say that we want to handle 10,000 requests. And once we're done with that, we'll call GC collect. And now let's debug and see what's going to happen at runtime and what objects are still alive or not. OK, we can take a memory snapshot and we can look at that. As we can see, we still have 10,000 request processors being alive and referenced by something. And let's see who holds the reference and prevents them from being collected. OK, in this case, this is app context and handle exception static variable. And this kind of does make sense. So the events in .NET are quite tricky. They hold a reference to the handler. So if you subscribe to an event, you're essentially passing yourself uh, uh, as an argument to the event. And if the event stays in memory, your instance still stays in memory. And because we never unsubscribe from that event, those instances cannot be collected by the GC. So how can we fix that? One way to solve this problem is to make this instance I disposable. So, but this is not as simple as you might think. Because when you use Lambda expression, the compiler generates a new delegate instance. And we cannot unsubscribe from uh, the old delegate instance by using a new delegate instance. So instead, what we need to do is we need to introduce a field. And then we need to subscribe that field to, to this event and unsubscribe uh, that field from the event. And now we need to remember to dispose the, our processor. And now let's see what's going to happen. So let's take a snapshot, and we already can see that the instances are gone. Good. Another way to solve this problem is to subscribe to these events only once. This might be a place where you initialize the application, and it's typically a place where, where you want to handle the main and handle exceptions, task and observed exceptions, and other events like that. But this case, when a short-lived object subscribes to a longer-lived object, is still possible, and that might cause memory leaks. And I've seen this in practice quite a few times. Let's look at another example. Let's say that our request processor uses meter class. Meter is part of metrics API that was added to .NET 8. And this is the standard way to handle and track metrics in .NET applications. So this class creates a meter instance, and then it creates a counter instance. And then we use counter to track that the request was successfully handled. And let's say that we have the same, the same case. We want to handle 10,000 requests, and then we force the, the GC collect just to make sure that all the instances that were allocated here are collected. Let's run this code. Let's take a snapshot, and let's look at the snapshot. And as you can see, we have a bunch of things being allocated. We still have 10,000 meters, and as well as other things related to metrics and meter API. So why the meter is still alive? Because all it seems like all of the meters being added to a static uh, variable called s underscore all meters. Okay, let's look at the code to see what's going on and what we should what should we do. Okay, let's go to meter meter class and then we can go to initialization and as we can see, this is the place where we add the currently creating instance to a list of all meters. This is static list and this is a lock and this is a global lock which is not a good sign by itself, because that's not gonna, going to be a very efficient way to, to create an instance. And let's see where the instance is removed from a, a static list. 
And as we can see, this is a dispose method, the same pattern. We have a lock and we remove this instance from a uh, global list of meters. Okay, so what should we do here? One option is we can make this class I disposable the same way as we did before, and we can dispose a meter uh, instance in the dispose method. But this is actually not a good idea and not the best practice. As we had seen already, meter constructor adds itself to a global list under a global lock. It means that it's not a very efficient way. So actually a better way to, to deal with this is to make meter static or global. You can register meter in a DI container, for instance, or you can just make it static. So let's see what's going to happen in this case. Obviously, since the meter is static, we are not going to see any of this um, alive in memory. Good. And as I said before, this is based on a true story. I was looking into a perf issue with one of our services. And the issue was that the meter was created per request and over time, the number of meters in memory was like hundreds of thousands, and if not millions, and that was drastically affecting the performance of the system. Let's look at another case. Let's say that we have a cache with an ability to refresh the data periodically. We can create a data refresher class that takes a delegate. Uh, we'll keep the delegate here, we can call it to get the data, and then the main uh, logic of this class is in this method called refresh data. We have a while loop until the token is canceled, and we periodically refresh the data, and we wait for a second. This might be configurable and whatnot. And we have a dispose method to stop the timer to break this loop. And then we have a finalizer in case someone forgets to call the dispose. This is a safety net to stop the cycle and um, avoid memory leaks. Okay, let's look at how we're going to use this. Obviously, we're going to use this incorrectly. Instead of disposing this, we will just create this instance, we'll wait for 500 milliseconds, and then we'll exit from this method. And then the refresh method doesn't do actually anything useful, it just traces that we refresh the data and then returns a new array. And then uh, in the main method, we're going to force a full GC collection. We'll do the GC collection twice because data refresher is a finalizable instance, and to collect a finalizable instance, you actually need two GC cycles. Let's run the code and see what's going to happen. As you can see, the GC happened, but the data refreshing is still happening. So it seems like the, the timer is running and the instance is not being collected by the GC. Let's look under the debugger why. Let's take a memory snapshot and let's inspect that. So we're looking for data refresher. And this instance is alive because uh, this is refresh data um, state machine that is generated by the compiler. And we can see that the async method is still running, and that's the reason why the state machine is still alive, and the state machine references the refresher, and that prevents uh, this refresher from being collected. Let's look at the code to understand it better. So when you use a timer, explicitly or implicitly, the timer acts as a strong reference. And so while the timer is running, the state machine that is used by this timer will be alive for as long as the timer runs. So in this case, unless you stop the timer, the state machine is not going, going to be eligible for the GC. Even though we have the finalizer, it's not going to help us here because the finalizer runs only when there is no references to the instance. But in this case, the state machine and the timer still reference this instance, preventing this from being collected. So how can we fix that? This is quite a bit of code, so I'm not going to write this on the fly. Uh, this is a weak timer. This is a quite similar pattern to weak events that uses weak references instead of using a normal reference. Let's see how it works. So weak timer takes a T, which is a target that we're going to call uh, the callback on. But instead of holding a T directly, we're going to wrap this into a weak reference. And the idea is that we periodically will check if this weak reference is still alive, and then we'll call on timer method. Otherwise, we're going to break the loop and stop the timer. We need to extract this logic into helper method because we want this code to work successfully in both debug and release build. And if we'll uh, inline that, uh, the local variable here is going to live for the duration of the whole method and nothing is going to work. Okay, so this code is just checks that the target is alive by checking, but getting the target and it just calls on time. And I have uh, a fixed version of uh, data refresher. 
So the logic is going to be even simpler. It needs to implement it, the callback, and uh, in the callback itself, we're going to refresh the data. And that's it. No finalization, no disposable, nothing. We can make it disposable if we want, but technically it's not needed. Once the, this instance goes out of scope and is collected by the GC, the timer will automatically be stopped. Let's change the code a little bit. Now we're going to use our new data refresher. We're going to wait for two seconds just to make sure that the callback is called more than once. And now we'll force just a single GC collection. And let's see what's going to happen. As we can see, we refresh the data a few times, but once the GC happened, we immediately stopped the timer which does make sense because we're using a weak reference and weak reference does not prevent the GC from collecting the instance. Good. You might disagree with such design, but I actually do think that the class like the weak timer is quite useful. Typically, not calling dispose makes the code potentially non-deterministic in terms of resource cleanup, but this doesn't cause actual memory leaks. And I prefer to make my code not leak in memory in this case as well. There are multiple ways to get memory leaks in .NET and all of them eventually boil down to a simple case. The instance is referenced by a long-lived or static object. If you suspect a memory leak, collect a memory dump, look at the number of instances, and check the GC path to figure out who prevents it from being collected. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comment below what .NET topic you want me to cover next. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.